Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn in your Bibles to Romans 3, 27. We're going to take a look at a scripture here. And this scripture says, Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. And here's what we need to understand. There is a law in the spirit realm called the law of faith. Now, there are natural laws in life. We have physical laws. We have laws of physics. Gravity is a, a good law. But you've got to understand that God is not going to break His laws that He has set into motion just because we might be too stupid to understand how they work or we're ignorant because we've ignored how to learn how they work. Now you can have somebody at the top of a building, a 45-story building, and they're getting ready to jump. They're getting ready to jump off the building. And you see them. And so you think to yourself, I don't want them to die. Does God want them to die? No, of course not. So you immediately pray, God, please suspend gravity so that this person will not die. So that when they jump off the building, that the gravity will not pull them down. You can pray that, but is it going to happen? If God did suspend gravity, then millions of people would die. On the highways, airplanes, people would start floating around, banging into walls. Millions of people would die if he suspended gravity. He's not going to suspend gravity for that one person. Why? It's a law that God put into motion. God instituted it in the beginning at creation, and it's a law. And if you want to have that law help you, that law is helping me right now. It's keeping me on the ground and giving me enough, enough traction I can walk. The law of gravity was created for the purpose of helping mankind do things while he's here on the earth. It's also created to keep him here on the earth. But we need to know how the law of gravity works. Now, the law of gravity has always been here. But you know what? There was a time when they didn't understand it. We don't completely understand it now. But there was a time when Sir Isaac Newton had an apple fall off a tree, and all of a sudden he realized there's gravity. What about electricity? You say, well, we've only had electricity for the last few decades, few hundred years, short period of time, actually. But electricity has always existed. Electricity existed when Jesus was here on the earth. Electricity existed. The laws of electricity were here. And electricity would have worked at the time of Moses. But why didn't Moses have electricity? Why didn't the disciples have electricity? It's because they didn't understand the laws of electricity. They didn't know what made it work. They existed, but without the knowledge of how to use it, it means nothing. Airplanes, listen to me, airplanes would have worked at the time of Moses. You say, well, they didn't have airplanes back then. Why? Because they wouldn't work? No, they would have worked. It's they didn't know how to make one. 
They didn't know how to make it work. Electricity existed at the time of Paul, but he didn't know how to make it work. He didn't understand it. See, everything must be used according to the laws that govern it. And there is the law of faith. Now, you can imitate something. Let's say, for example, you took somebody from the past and you brought them up into the current time and they saw electricity. They saw electricity. And so they went back into the past and they said, well, you know, all you have to do is you just run lines from, this, from a pole outside. You just run lines from a pole. That's all it is. And then when you get inside the house, you run these lines all through the house, and then you touch the end of the line. And so they get twigs and sticks and, or ropes and run them through the... No, they're not going to work. And even if they could put insulation and make it work, if they didn't understand that copper conducted electricity, and they decided to put wood on the inside of the... or, or rubber on the inside of the pipe... You can make something look like it will work, but it will not work unless you actually use the laws that govern what it is you're trying to make it work. Hmm. You could show them an airplane, and they could go out and they could put wings on a box. It means nothing. See, the laws of faith must be used properly. And God has given us the laws of faith in His Word, but so often we don't understand them and we, we do like somebody would do that came back from the, from the past. We imitate something. We see faith work in somebody else's life and so we say, well, that's what they said and that's where they went and that's what they did. And so if I say and go and do what they did, then that means I'm in faith. No, that may mean you're imitating somebody who was in faith. But there are laws of faith. See, we need to understand in the same way that electricity was here a thousand years before Jesus, but they just didn't know how to activate it. Salvation is here on the earth for everybody. It's been accomplished. Jesus died for who? The whole world. He, he died for the whole world. But is everybody saved? No. No. Only those who know how to activate that salvation. But see, it's the same way with healing. Are we waiting for God to all of a sudden insert healing into our life? Or insert healing into the earth? Or bring healing to this church service? No, the reality is He paid the price for the healing. It's already done. But we activate that healing through the laws of faith and the laws that govern how to get healed. And it involves many different things. It starts with believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth, but there's so much. Now, let's take a look at this Scripture. Let's remind ourselves of this. 1 Peter 2.24 Who Himself bore our sins in His own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. Now look at the last part of this. By whose stripes you were healed. In other words, healing has been accomplished. I said healing has been accomplished. And it's about as silly to pray that God will send healing to you and heal you as it is for you to be an electrician and then go out and stand outside the house and say, electric company, would you please send electricity? No, it's, it's already there at the meter. You just got to know how to hook it up. Healing is at the meter. You just need to know how to hook it up. Now, there's been some confusion, and we've been sidetracked in a way in the church from some of the main points that have been made. And sometimes there's stories in the Bible, follow me on this, sometimes there's stories in the Bible in two different places, and they seem to contradict each other. And people who don't know the Bible will say, well, the Bible can't be real because this story says this, 
And over in another book, it says this. And it contradicts. But I want to show you this morning a truth about faith. Two stories that look like they contradict, but they don't contradict. And they're tied to Scriptures we use all the time. So I want you to dig in deep with your understanding right now. And we're going to talk about Jesus and the fig tree. Now let's go to Matthew 21.18. Now this story is recorded, Jesus and the fig tree is recorded twice in the Bible. It's recorded in Matthew and it's recorded in Mark. And I'm going to tell you right now where the controversy comes in. In Matthew, it says that he cursed the fig tree and immediately it died. In Mark, it says he cursed the fig tree and it didn't look like anything happened and they went back the next day and they noticed it was dead. So which was it? Immediately or the next day? Let's take a look at this. Matthew 21.18 now, in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. Now, if you will talk with somebody who understands fig trees in Israel, there is a time when the, the figs come and then the leaves come. When, when they have leaves on a fig tree, there's supposed to be figs there. All right? That's why it mentions the leaves here. He found nothing but leaves. And he said, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately, the fig tree was withered away. One version says the fig tree was dead. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? So Jesus answered and said to them, assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will you will what? You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but also if you say to the mountain, if you say to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. And whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. So, you hear that story? Now, in Mark, it tells the story in a little more detail. Now Jesus actually, he went into Jerusalem two different times to cast the money changers out. Once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end of his ministry. This is at the end of his ministry. Now the next day as they came out from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if it perhaps would have something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. Well, you say, well, if it wasn't the season of figs, why did he go over there? Because it had leaves on it. And some of your Bibles will say, in response, Jesus said, in verse 14, in response he said, uh, more correctly, and you'll see it in the, in the King James, it says, and he answered the fig tree. Well, you don't answer somebody that hasn't spoken. Yeah, that fig tree spoke to him. It said, I've got figs. Because how did it say that? It had leaves. And he saw from afar off it had leaves, which meant it's supposed to have, it may have been in season, out of season, that's all irrelevant. If it had leaves, it was supposed to have figs. And he was hungry, and he saw the leaves on the fig tree, and he walked over to it, and when he got there, that fig tree lied to him. And he said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Now then, he went into Jerusalem, and he cast the money changers out. That's another part of the story. But then if you drop back down to verse 20, it's the next day. Now, you will find, like in the book of Genesis, it talks about how God created man and woman, and it just basically tells the story real briefly. Then it turns right around, and it tells the story in detail. Well, you see the same thing here. This is the, the detail version. Now, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up where? From its roots. And Peter 
remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to him, Have faith in God, for assuredly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you re receive, and the word them is not there, it's italicized. Believe that you receive and you will have. So now what did he teach them in all this? When they were on their way to Jerusalem, he cursed the fig tree. And what happened? Immediately, the fig tree died. Immediately it died. But evidently, immediately, it didn't look like it died. When you read the detail of the story, it didn't look like it. But was it dead? Yes, it was dead. Why? Because Jesus cursed it. Then when they went back the next day, then it had dried up from the roots, and you could tell it. And Jesus then gives this principle. If you say to that mountain, now here, let's, let's get clear on this. Jesus didn't go up to the fig tree and pray. Now, I'm, I'm a strong believer in prayer. I'm not, I'm not cutting prayer in any way. I think we need to have prayer groups. I think we need to have intercessory prayer. There's a purpose for prayer. But you'll find Jesus did not go to the fig tree and pray. He did not go to the fig tree and ask the Father to curse it. Now follow me on this. He didn't, he didn't tell God to do it. He didn't believe God would do it. He simply took the authority that he had. Now, now listen to this. And he spoke to the tree. Now that sounds crazy. It sounds crazy. But Jesus spoke to the tree. And then when his disciple, when Peter was all like, whoa, look what happened. Then Jesus explained to him. He said, now here's what I'm telling you. If you say to that mountain, if you say to that mountain, like I said to the fig tree, be removed and be cast into the sea. He's using that as an example. You may have a mountain in your path in your life. It may be finances. It may be healing. It, it may be emotional relationships. Who knows what it is? Only you know. But whatever it is, Jesus said, speak to it. Now, now listen to me. You don't talk to God about your problem. You talk to your problem about God. You speak to the fig tree. Now, you say, well, how in the world do I do that? When you have pain in your body, you're not going to find where it says in the Bible that you're supposed to beg God to take the pain away. And that's what most people do. God, please take the pain away. Oh God, I know you can. I know you can take this sickness from me. I know you can do it. But God, and I know I probably don't deserve it, but God, I just ask that somehow in your grace and in your mercy, you'll touch my body and that you will heal me. When in reality, he says he's already done it. By the stripes of Jesus, you have been healed. So it's not about you begging God to do something. No, the natural law is already here. Healing is here. Healing is here. We need to know how to activate it. And Jesus told Peter how to activate it. He says you speak to it. The thing that you want gone, if you've got pain in your body, if you've got sickness in your body, you speak to it. You say, well, how do I do that? You say, tumor, I speak to you in the name of Jesus, and I command you to be cast into the sea. You're, you're, I curse you. You say, well, I don't really believe that will work. Well, then it won't. 
Well, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to work. I, I grew up in church, and man, we prayed for, for Sister, uh, whatever her name was, is healing, and we just prayed and prayed and prayed. Well, what happened? Well, she died. Well, then how's that working out for you? This does not mean we cannot pray for other people. This does not mean that we cannot lay hands on the sick and they will recover. This is Jesus giving us an answer to the law of faith, telling us how faith works. We have been, to everyone, we, we have been given the measure of faith. Now our faith, I believe, according to Scripture, our faith can grow, our faith can be small, it can be undeveloped, it can be great faith. Jesus talked about great faith. But we have faith. And Jesus said, here's how much faith it takes. If you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds, you don't have to be a rocket scientist in the spiritual world. You can just be a regular Christian. But if you can just believe and have the faith of a mustard seed, and if you will speak to that problem in the name of Jesus. Well, I feel self-conscious speaking to it. Well, too bad. That's kind of like somebody saying, well, I feel self-conscious going up to the front of the church and, and telling everybody that I love Jesus and I want to get saved. Well, it's your choice. I place before you life and death. Please choose life. Jesus gave us a law of faith. Now, in that law, he said, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, verse 23, are you whoever? He didn't say preachers. He said whoever. Whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things, what? Believes that those things he says will be done. What's the result? Verse 23, he will have whatever he says. See, we are told that life and death are in the power of the tongue. But you can't be parroting someone else. You have to believe in your heart. And you have to build the faith. And this is where we get into Romans 10, 17, where it says, so then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So if you need healing, then you read Scriptures on healing. If you need personal finance help, you read Scriptures on prosperity and finances. If you need uh, emotional help, then you read Scriptures on how God heals the broken heart. And you meditate on these things. And meditate doesn't mean that you just go, uh, yeah, but the stripes of Jesus, I've been healed. Okay, let's turn on TV. No, it means you sit and you think about it. You, you let these Scriptures get into you. you. You soak them in. You soak in them. See, so often we pray and we ask God to do stuff that He's told us to do. Jesus didn't say, pray to God to speak to the mountain. He didn't say, come in for counseling. He said, speak to the mountain. <laughs> oh, wow. So how many times do we talk to God about our problems? See, prayer, prayer should be 90% in my that's statistics, you know. 75% uh, of the time statistics are wrong and the other 82%, they're right. Uh, But I believe, I believe 90% of prayer should be worshiping and praising God and thanking Him for what He has done. Thanking Him that He has paid the price. Thanking Him that He sent His Son to pay the price for my healing. Thanking Him that He took on poverty so I don't have to be in poverty. Thanking Him that He sent His Son to heal the brokenhearted and Jesus defeated all the works of the devil. Thanking Him for that and praising Him. And then, when we're done doing that, then taking authority over what the enemy's trying to do to us. 
Hmm. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So often we cancel out what we say we believe with our words. We will, even when we do it wrongly, we ask God to heal us, which He's already done. We should just be thanking Him for the healing that's here. But we ask Him to do something, and then the very next time we're talking with one of our friends, and they say, well, how are you doing? You say, well, I'm doing better. I, I asked God to take it away, but He hasn't done it yet. Well, let, let me tell you something. God's not going to take it away. Okay, put the tomatoes back in your purse. I said, <laughs> God is not going to take it away. Because He's not going to do something that He's told you to do, and He's given you authority to do it. It's just like when Peter was in prison, the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord opened the gates, the angel of the Lord took the shackles off, the angel of the Lord blinded the eyes of the guards, <clears throat> but the angel of the Lord kicked Peter and said, get up! Why did he do that? Because that's what Peter could do. God's not going to do for you something he's given you the power to do, and you're just too lazy to do it. Okay. James 4, 7. Here's what we got to do. If you want the devil to be gone, there's something you got to do. You got to resist him. See, you, you can't give in to sickness. You can't give in to disease. I know of people who have become so familiar with their illness that they won't say it, but they like it. Because they have built their friends network around their illness. Too often we're asking God to resist the devil for us. You know, like, dear God, make it go away. And God says, I gave you the measure of faith, and I gave you the authority over all the power of the enemy, and I sent my son, and he gave you the laws of how to operate in that authority, so why aren't you doing what I told you to do and equipped you to do? Look, from the very beginning, in Genesis 126, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them, man, have what? <clears throat> Dominion. He, he gave us. He said, okay, here you go. You've got this. Dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creepy thing, every creeping thing. <laughs> He's given you authority over creeps. Over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Let me tell you who creeps on the earth. The devil. He goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. Who is he going to devour? Whom will let him? As we said last week, he, he, it's, it's like in the, on the Discovery Channel, he's looking for the animal that thinks it's got a better way than the way of God, and it kind of goes off on its own. And once he can find an animal that's off on its own, when you get, when you get stranded and you separate yourself from God, you will find that you start thinking strange. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions. Serpents and scorpions is a metaphor for the devil and his demons. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you authority. Did he, does it say, I will give you authority? No. I give you authority. I give you authority over all the power of the enemy. 
So how much power of the enemy do you have authority over? Do you have authority over headaches and, and backaches, but you really don't have authority over uh, cancers and tumors and diabetes and, and blood disorders and diabetes? You know, do you not have authority over those things? Or do you have authority over all the power of the enemy? Well, let me ask you this. Is sickness of God or is it of the devil? Maybe, maybe that's a situation we need to put ourselves in right now. See, some people don't want to take authority over sickness because they believe God put it on them to teach them something. Well, just let me ask you this. How smart are you now? Are, are you Mr. Theologi or Mrs. Theological Giant now? <laughs> Maybe we just all need to go to the hospital so God can make us smart, and then we'll meet over here in three weeks. And boy, we'll be the smartest Christians in the world. No, God doesn't make you sick to teach you something, and He doesn't put you in a situation in a hospital just so you can witness to the nurse. Have I ever witnessed to nurses? Yes, I witness all the time. I think it's fun. But I don't have to get sick to go to the hospital to do it. I was at Walmart yesterday. Very few people were at Walmart with all the st storms that were here. That's why I like to go when there's storms. You can actually get through a checkout lane on the same day. And uh, so I was, I was checking out, and I'd never seen this lady before. And so I'm checking out, and, and uh, Loretta's going to be down with Billy Brim for a few days, so I was getting my TV dinners. <laughs> and my supplies so I didn't starve while she was gone. And uh, so I'm standing there, and the lady, as far as I know, I'd never seen her before, and she said, you know what? You sound just like you sound on the radio. Oh, thank you, ma'am. That's very nice. So uh, she said, you write a lot of books, don't you? And I said, well... Yeah, and so she starts asking me questions. Well, what's your latest book? And I said, well, Finding Hope When Things Look Hopeless. She goes, oh, boy, yeah. I could sure use that one. I said, well, write your name and address down on the back of my receipt, and I'll send you one tomorrow. Actually, I meant day after tomorrow. Uh, and so she did. So, you know, hey, there's a witness from going to Walmart. I had a problem with, uh, with Spectrum, with my television service. And so I got the technician on the line yesterday. I have no idea where, he, where he's from. I have no idea. But in the midst of the conversation, after waiting 30 minutes on hold, see, you know, after waiting 30 minutes on hold, I could have, I could have led into this guy. I could have said, <laughs> You have any idea how long I've been on hold? You know, I could have, I could have done that, but you know, whew, I sucked it up and hey, and he said, he said, "What can I do for you?" And I said, "Well, I said, I need, I need my cable fixed." He goes, "Amen. We need to get that done." I heard him say, "Amen." Man, I'm like, that's like saying sick him to a dog, man. I just. <laughs> So, you're a believer, huh? <clears throat> oh, yeah, I'm a believer. Now, all of a sudden, who cares about the phone or whatever it was? Who cares? That was a different issue. But, you know, here's the whole thing. <clears throat> God can use us in those situations, but God, God didn't mess up my house with lightning strike in order to get me to talk to that guy. Or He didn't make me run out of food or make Loretta go out of town so I'd have to go down to Walmart no, he'll, he'll use us wherever we are. I said, he'll use us wherever we are. So you don't have to get sick to go to the hospital to witness to the nurse or the doctor. Because the nurse and the doctor, they go to Walmart too. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.7 2 Corinthians 5.7 We walk by faith and not by sight. What does that mean? That means that when we curse the fig tree because it lied to us, when we curse the sickness or disease, 
you don't look at it, and because you don't see anything, you need to understand this. The authority that you took worked at the moment you took it you may not see it. It may be the next day before you see it wither. It may be three months before you see it wither. But you need to understand when you cursed it, it died. And immediately, when Jesus cursed the fig tree, immediately it died. But it died up from the roots. And the root is what determines the fruit. So you need to kill things at the root. But when it's the roots are underground, you don't see them. So you pray for deliverance, you pray for healing, <clears throat> you, you pray for some supernatural thing to take place and you take authority and you curse the thing that's come against you and tell it to be cast into the sea. And if you don't see anything, and that's what most people, this is one of the laws of faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. One of the things most people do, probably not... <laughs> Another statistic, 93.7% of the people do this, is they will take their authority and then they open their eyes and look to see if it worked. And they watch it. And then the thought comes in, well, I, I wonder if God's going to do that this time. Maybe... Maybe I need to do something else to get it to work. Maybe I didn't read enough Scriptures today. You know, I talked with a lady a few weeks ago who had something happen in her life. Actually, what it was, she'd had a car wreck. And she, she goes, I knew it was going to happen. I just knew it was going to happen. I pray every morning, and this morning I forgot to pray and plead the blood of Jesus. I, And so... I had a car wreck. That's basing your life upon works. That's basing God's protection upon your performance. God knows your heart. And if you forget to pray over your food at one meal, God's not going to poison the food and kill you. Are you following me? See, we get so caught up in the law. We've been delivered from the law. God loves us. He's not looking for excuses to eliminate us. He's looking for excuses to help us. All right. Hmm. Once again, it's okay to pray for things. And there's places in the Bible where it talks about praying. Praying for health. But they are very few. And you'll find that almost every single example, almost every single example, 91.3% of the examples in the Bible are things like stand up and walk. Pick up your bed and go. Do we do that? Well, probably not most of the time. Why not? Because somehow we don't believe that we have the authority. And we've been raised in the tradition that if you just beg God long enough, oh, just going to beg Him. God, God, you know, Sister Judy, she's a good old gal, God. She's gone to church all of her life. And I know she's got flamboritis. And doctor says she's going to die from flamboritis. God, I know you can do it. God, just do it. Heal her right now. I'm watching. Come on. Dear God, come on. Heal her now. Maybe if I just had three more people pray with me. Maybe if we'd hold hands and sing kumbaya. And, and we come up with all of these silly religious things that are just that. They are, I heard one minister one day call it Christian voodoo. God loves us. And He's not walking around with a clipboard with like 15 things on here. Oh my goodness, they didn't bow their head when they prayed. Oh...
Oh, oh, <laughs> they looked around. Okay, well, that puts them over 50% on the, I'm not going to do it. No, that's not the way it works. God loves us. And the, the, the power for healing is here. <clears throat> Remember when, when in the Bible it says, and they went into this house and the power was there to heal them. They weren't waiting for the power to get there. The power was there. But that faith had to be activated. Just because healing was in the house didn't mean everybody in the house was healed. No. Healing is in this house. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Healing is in the house. He's done it all. How much more do you want Jesus to do? You want Him to take stripes again so that you can be healed? No, He's already done it. And honestly, when you ask God to do something He's told you to do, it's almost like a slap in God's face because you're saying, God, you, you just didn't do enough. No, He's done everything. And now it's, the ball's in our court. What are we going to do? Well, first thing we got to do is we got to start believing. We got to start believing that healing is here. We need to start believing that we've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. And then when that mountain gets on our path, we speak to that mountain and we say, I curse you, cancer. I curse you, diabetes. I can't curse you, pain. I curse you. And I command you to be gone. And don't come back with, well, that should work. I hope it works. No, that's where believe. Wow. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, what did He not do? He didn't examine the fig tree. He did not examine the fig tree. But here's something to understand. People were watching. And people are watching you. And they're watching to see what they are watching to see the results. You don't need to be watching to see the results because you know the results. You know. I said you know. But the world doesn't know. And that's how you can witness right there. When the world sees you having gone to the doctor and the doctor says you're going to die and you don't die, that's a pretty good witness. I say, that's a pretty good witness. And they'll say, well, wh why didn't you die? I say, because I cursed what they said I had, and I cast it out, and that's it. Sounds, sounds simple, doesn't it? Here's the deal. It's so simple, most people miss it. It's like salvation. People try to do things to get saved. You know, it doesn't matter how many times you twirl the, the beads, Hail Marys, how many times you go to church, how much money you pay. You can't buy salvation. It comes by grace you've been saved through faith. Praise God. I said, praise God. Did you learn anything today? All right. So we're gonna we're gonna keep we're gonna keep chopping away at this. And this church is gonna be a church full of healed people. And you're not gonna be just healed physically, you're gonna be healed financially, and you're gonna be healed in your heart. We're not gonna we're not gonna put up with anybody in this church having a broken heart, a broken body, or broken finances. You say, well. What do we do if somebody does? Don't condemn. Don't, don't point a finger. Don't say, well, I guess they didn't have faith. You know, Brother Hagin said that for years he didn't have anybody die in his church. And he took that as pride. And all of a sudden one day somebody died. He said, well, you must not have been a good preacher. You're not responsible for anybody but you. I said, you're not responsible for anybody but you. 
So we're going we're gonna to stand together and we're going to believe. Let's stand up right now. Let's make this confession. In the name of Jesus, and according to His Word, I have been healed. <clears throat> and if I have been healed, I am healed. My head is healed. My shoulders are healed. My organs are healed. My muscles are healed. My feet are healed. My nervous system is healed. My mind is renewed. I have been healed. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you all. Love you all.